as you know, or most of you know, uh, seven of us went to Belize, and we did something a little bit different this year, and that is that the Belize VBS program coincides with um, Bridgeway VBS, and it also coincides with Bridgeway uh, inductive study, inductive Bible study on the Gospel of Luke. So what we try to, um, what we're trying, what we're hoping for is that what we study and learn and what we teach our kids and what our kids are learning can all be transported to discipleship and mission. That what we study, what we meditate, what we have received from God can be passed on to our children and our children and, and the leaders can take that same message to somewhere else. So um, we really hope that um, we can apply what we know in our own heart and also give that heart to somebody else that is outside of our range. All right. And my question to you as we get into the sermon is this. When does a healthy desire become a sin? When does a healthy desire, like the man in the story who wants to walk, becomes a sin? That's the question. Because all of us, we walk here today. We walk up the stairs. We have capable body. But to this man, eventually, that healthy desire and normal everyday activity ensnared him, and that has become a sin for him. We have many healthy desires, many normal everyday activities, getting a job, getting married, buying a phone, buying a house, um, hanging out with friends, getting a six pack for, uh, uh, for the beach maybe, and getting our hair done. I need a haircut. But th we have so many healthy desires that are normal. What we see in this story is that the most normal, everyday, mundane activity can darken somebody's heart. So as you see in this story, and I won't go into the whole um, background because I just did it in the children's sermon. Imagine the shock of the paralyzed man and his friends. They tore through a tile on the roof. That, that takes a lot of gusto and a lot of commitment. I mean, that, that's just beyond, um, you know, like normal response to what an average and normal people would do. They knew the desperation of their friend. And they themselves loved their friend, and they really wanted him to be healed. They put all their stock, all their trust, all their faith in Jesus, and they climbed up a building. And there, they toured the straw thatch roof, which was easily done. It's not like here they had to, you know, uh, come down in a rope with a blast of an explosion. But they tore that down, and they lowered him through that house and plopped him down in front of Jesus. This is a moment of truth. Jesus healed him. We've heard about what you can do. You heal the blind man so that he can see. You heal the bleeding woman who suffered for so long. Twelve years of suffering. We heard you raised the dead. Certainly, if that's your resume, and that's within your scope of power, you can heal my friend. And there... Instead of healing their friend, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. It is because this man has been paralyzed for so long that his simple healthy desire to walk again has captured his heart in entirety. Do you have something like that? That when you just look out the window, you see people doing things. You just open up another window on your screen, and you see people going places, eating things that you didn't even see, you don't even know that existed, going to places that you've always wanted to go to. 
doing things, hanging out with friends, meeting celebrities, celebrities in the streets of New York, all the things that you dreamed about. Posting about their new next job, you know, gig that they got, which was better than the last one. All of these stories, all of these everyday mundane activities, you desire them. You want them to a point where there is no room in your heart for anything else but that. That is your greatest desire. That is your greatest want. What we see in this story is that when heart does not desire God, that it becomes paralyzed. And it really, it, it, it's not, it, this paralysis comes from just everyday things. If you're a kid, it's Pokemon card. If you are single, it's maybe having a someone significant. But it just keeps coming in, keeps making way it's in and say, if you don't have this, you are less. If you don't participate in life like everyone else is doing, then you are less. I recently heard of a, a story of a woman whose half of her body and the left side of her body is paralyzed to the stroke. She, one day, uh, with, her, with the help of her husband, got up, sat on her porch, and looked out, and saw a mom and her daughter walking together hand in hand. And I, I haven't done that in a long time. You know, um, Karis really didn't like to hold hands. She was always doing stuff. Sophia still locked arms, so that's cool. But what she realized was, this is my last and only dream. My hope in life is that I wish I can walk with my daughter holding her hand. Because she had two daughters. Until then, her life was about raising kids, paying mortgages, getting a car, making sure everything is okay, and think about this and that. But when her body became paralyzed, half paralyzed, she realized what she really wanted, something simple, to walk with her daughter again. And I'm telling you, this is all normal. You wanting a job is healthy. New phone? Yeah. I mean, they cost like $2,000, but whatever. It's healthy-ish. Wanting bubble tea, eating out, meeting your friends, getting a job, succeeding in your job, all healthy. But I'm trying to get all of us to think about at what point does this become unhealthy? I knew a girl who desperately wanted a boyfriend. This is all in high school. Let's call her Nancy. And she actually got a boy. A nice guy, but then you know, you're young, you're dumb, and he wanted to break up for whatever reason it was. In order to hold on to him, she decided to sleep with him. And that delayed the un inevitable outcome of breakup, but it delayed it. But she realized that she has something that can get men and delay the breakup, and that became her pattern. And I remember sitting down with her and talking about that, and I thought, wow, you are honest to admit that. And I hope, it, I hope God, will, God can do something and help you as you journey through this. Men have their own sins. Women have their own tendencies, and each individual, regardless of the gender, they all figured out how to get what they want at the cost of sinning, at the cost of compromising, and at the cost of pushing God out of their heart. You may get what you want, and you may have what you want in abundance, but I'm telling you, your heart is paralyzed. Our heart was made by God to want Him and to have Him at the center. 
have him at the top of priorities and categories. When we don't have that, other desires will take over and it will paralyze your heart. His friends brought him down the roof and when Jesus saw him, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. It is only through Christ that our idolatrous heart receives its speed back again. Our heart moves again in the presence of Christ. Imagine their friends dropping him down and he, Jesus says, oh, I know what you want. Walk. And he gets that. Now imagine you and I getting what we want. We want Bitcoin to go up. We want NVIDIA to never drop again. I want I want to have six-pack. I want to have the next greatest gadget, the newest thing. Imagine every time you drop, Jesus gives you what you want. Now we have to have a moment of, of realistic thinking. Is this the Jesus that you seek? Is this how you perceive God to be? That you desire something so desperately that every time you drop in front of him, he gives that to you. And you just get what you want. He is the greatest fulfillment of mankind that you get what you want. But Jesus gives you what you want and more. He gives you what you want and more. Jesus didn't say, I know what's wrong with you. Your heart is paralyzed. So I'm going to resuscitate your heart. But you'll be crippled for the rest of your life. Because that's your idolatry and I hate it. No. He figured out for him how to walk in God. What is our solution, brothers and sisters? Your heart is filled with, the, with thoughts of employment. So solution is be an be a unemployed guy for the rest of your life or unemployed person for the rest of your life? No. Solution is to work in Christ. What does it mean to be a Christian worker? What does it mean for a Christian to be in the marketplace? What does it mean to be married as a Christian man and Christian woman? How can I raise my child as a Christian person? With a new heart, with new priorities, how can I live in the world, not outside of the world? How can I be in the world but not be of it? And that's what this story reveals. That when you are dropped in front of Christ, you can't help but to look into your heart. He will pierce into your heart and you can't help but to look and say, yes, I have idols. I have deep-seated desires, and I don't know what to do with them. And it is that place where the blood of Christ is applied. The forgiveness of sins is not through your religious activities. Forgiveness of sins is not through your steeled will. Forgiveness of sins is not through your good intentions and good behavior, but it is through the blood of Christ who died on the cross for us. That washes our sins white as snow. That washes all sins at all times, for God's steadfast love endures forever. We can't live in the world with a paralyzed heart that only desires one thing, one, going from one phase and one desire and then one, I don't know, hobbies from another, and we just keep transitioning from one thing to another, always paralyzed, always frozen, always dead, that we only feel alive when we find something new again. No, it is time for us to come to Christ and say, take away my sins. Take away the, the idea that I can, I can be a better person when I get dropped and get what I want. Make me whole again, cleanse me, so that my heart corresponds to yours. And that's what Christ does.
There is one more thing that I want to mention in this story that concerns all of us. So far, I've been speaking to the individuals, your own desires and your own paralysis of your heart. And I'm sharing with you that as you come and ask the Lord for forgiveness, that he will cleanse you and you can live in the world with a new heart. That you live in the world, you work and you love and you carry on with a true living, the heart of flesh. But there is another thing that I want to share with you. Notice that this man is a paralyzed man and that Jesus forgave him not because of his faith, but because of the faith of his friends. It is the faith of his friends. This man is spiritually, physically, emotionally frozen. But Jesus saw the faith of his friends. And we can't help but to wonder, who will carry me when my heart is frozen? Or will I carry my friend in this church? Do I have desire to live in a community where I carry the one who is paralyzed? That I will carry someone through the roof and lower them down, not in front of Calvinism, although I'm a Calvinist myself, not in front of liberalism, not in front of conservatism, not in front of my own self-ego, I'm doing this for you, but I drop you in front of Jesus Christ. That at the end, you would know him and know him more and more, that you would glorify him and you would thank him. Can we have that kind of friendship? That as we prepare for VBS, that we think of this material going across the sea to someone else's doorstep and someone else's heart. That as you study the Gospel of Luke or whatever that you're learning and studying, do you have someone that you want to carry in front of Jesus Christ? Knowing that it is not you who will heal, but it's only Christ heals, but I can at least bring that person in front of Christ. We live in a community. And today, Josh has shared that he is glad that he had people who walk with him. Sonny and David would never preach to them, but they embody the gospel. We have Sean Kim, who brought him to softball and showed him what it means to be included in the church. That led him to know the scripture and to the church at the feet of Christ again. Brothers and sisters, how do you define your fellowship? Do you want people to carry you into popularity, acceptance? I feel like I'm, I'm seen, I'm heard, I like, I'm liked, I'm accepted. Is that where you want to be dropped off? Or do you want your friendship here to bring you to Christ? Are you okay with people carrying you when they observe that you're paralyzed, that your heart is frozen? Are you okay, brothers and sisters, journeying with someone up a wall, spending your energy and your time to love that person, to hold faith for your friend. It's not because you're not carrying your friend because he, oh, he has potential. I can see that there's a like glimmer of hope and he has a lot of faith and he had all this background, uh, you know, history of being in Jesus. No, I'm only carrying you, not because I see something in you, but because I simply value you and I just want you to go to Christ. I will hold faith for both of us. You don't have to have faith now. I will have it for you on your behalf. Sounds strange, doesn't it? 
in a very individual and private world that we live in, where individual trumps all things, that someone else can hold something that you need and lead you to a place where you're healed and stored again, restored again. Church is one place where it's okay to be helpless. It's okay to admit that you're missing something here. It's okay to say, hey, I, I, what I really want is a job. I, that's all I think about. And then when I get the job, maybe I'll think of Jesus and, and do Jesus stuff, but then now I have to think about promotion. Church is, trans, is a place of helpless people gathered together, waiting for that time when we come, we're dropped in front of Jesus and we meet Jesus, that we are transformed in him and through him at, at the cost of his own blood. Let us have fellowship such as this. Let us have mindset such as this, that we shake off our own idols, come to Christ, with our darkened heart, and say, you have it. You have it. Cure me. Make me want the things that I need to, that make me want the things that are righteous and pleasing to you. Our heart is truly meant to seek God and God alone, and everything is subdued under that premise. I'm not preaching today that you should not achieve your goals in life your career goals, or any other goals that you may have. Actually, I applaud you for having goals and wanting to succeed in life. But let us ask today, is my heart darkened and paralyzed as a result, or is my heart made of flesh and beating so strongly that nothing can take over? When our heart is orientated toward obsession, although these things may be healthy things, our heart will cease to move. I invite you, I implore you once again, come to Christ. He will pierce into your heart. He will make you look into your heart and make you recognize that your healthy, normal, everyday thing is now have become sin. And you will have no other choice but to repent. He will nudge you. He will speak to you. He will never barge into your heart, but he will convict you. And that's where you and I experience a transformation and newness of life. Let us pray together. Father God, we pray that we will experience the newness of heart that we may share with others. Let there be true fellowship, Bridgeway, where we, what we experience is not privatized. It's not a lamp that is hidden under a bowl, but it is shared. Father God, we pray that our expectation of fellowship is not soft, cushy acceptance, but we come to Christ and become like him more and more. I pray, God, that our fellowship in our church will also include carrying others when they do not have faith, when they feel hopeless, when their heart is darkened. Let our faith, let our fellowship not only, uh, not, let, our, not fellow, let our fellowship not thrive when everybody is happy, when everybody is intelligent and everyone wants Jesus sincerely, but let our fellowship thrive when people don't want Jesus. When there is sadness, darkness, paralysis, people walking away from the church and people walking away from Christ and people do not have a single good thing to say about Christ, let people come. Let people come in patience, kindness, gentleness, and humility. That they, the, the, the ones who are darkened and lost, may be carried through the faith that we have that we receive from Christ. Thank you, Lord, for making this wonderful community called church where we are so countercultural to everything that we, we have seen and heard in the world. Holy Spirit, come. Give us fellowship that we need and revive our heart once again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.